In our opening section, I would like to talk about the life and music of the Africans before they were brought to America as slaves. Many people think of Afro-Americans as being slaves only in this country, but that's not true. We had a history of slavery many hundreds of years before the first white man ever came to the African shore. The various African tribes fought each other just as European tribes and city-states fought each other. In Africa, when one tribe conquered another, many times they'd kill all their enemies. At other times, they'd kill just the men and take the women and children with them. Victorious nomadic tribes sometimes sold their victims to tribes who were stationary and who were engaged in farming or fishing, things like that. They trained them to do the kind of work they wanted them to do. And if they found out these people had their musical talents, then they would train them in the history and music of the conquering tribe. Musicians were very important in the tribes in those days because back then they didn't have a system of writing, you see, and the musicians were supposed to remember all the events of importance and be able to recite the history of the tribe. These slave musicians and historians, or griot as they were sometimes called, continued to be tribe historians even after they had gained their freedom and become a part of the tribe. You see, in Africa, the slaves could earn their freedom after a certain length of time, and there was a rule that the children of these slaves were not brought up as slaves but as free people. And that was the difference between slavery in Africa and in America. In Africa, most every type of public activity was accompanied by some kind of music. Music was used for ceremonies, festivals, and dances to accompany happy or sad occasions or as part of the religious gatherings or just even to express hatred toward one another. Musicians accompanied warriors into battle just like the fife and drum corps in America in the colonial days. And they would sing and play to encourage the soldiers to extend themselves. Music was used to accompany working, fishing, going to funerals, praying to God to help them with their crops, and in any number of ways. The distinction between performer and audience in African music was often blurred. The audience was more than a group of observers or listeners. They became doers by their own singing and clapping and dancing. A typical performance of African music would include an ensemble of, well, instruments and singers and dancers. The songs often used by the Africans consisted of a recitative and a short response by the chorus. This form of singing has been referred to by the musicologists as being call and response. This was a very common African form that we brought with us to the colonies. One example of the call and response form is a little song called Certainly Lord. As in all call and response songs, the leader says something and then the choir answers. In this song, the leader says, have you got good religion? Only he says, <laughs> he says it fast and hadn't got time to say religion. So he just says allegiance. Then the choir answers, certainly, Lord. The leader says, for instance, have you got good religion? And the choir says, certainly, Lord. Have you got good religion? Certainly, Lord. Have you got good religion? Certainly, Lord. Certainly, 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 Lord. We have many, many songs in this same vein where the leader says something and the other answers. Here's another example. I'll be walking in the kingdom when I lay my burden down. I'll be walking in the kingdom when I lay my burden down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burden down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, when I lay my burden down. Then I happen to think of another one that's even better than that, called No Condemnation. 
The leader says, tell me, how do you feel? And the choir says, and no condemnation. How do you feel? No condemnation. How do you feel? No condemnation. No condemnation in my soul. Do you feel like shouting? No condemnation. Feel like shouting? No condemnation. You feel like shouting? No condemnation. No condemnation in my soul. That's a lovely song. I hadn't thought of that song in years. There's no condemnation in my soul. Then a choir would sing along with the leader, and the leader would sing as long as he could think of something new to sing. He'd just make verses and improvise. The improvisatory nature of the music had a direct bearing on the rhythm, melody, and harmony, and so the music was always changing in some way. Rhythm and percussion played a large part in the music of the Africans. It was quite common in African music to have two or more different rhythm patterns going at the same time, with each different rhythm pattern played by a different type of percussion instrument. Drums, of course, were an essential part of the emphasis on percussion, and you could find many types of drums in use all over Africa. Certain types of drums, like talking drums from Ghana, made from the ear of a female elephant, were used for sending messages over long distances. I saw those drums when I was in Ghana, those talking drums. In fact, I have a set at home. The blacks in the West Indian Islands have a type of music which they call uh, calypso, but it's the same form of music used in Africa, and it's really a way of telling a story. In Africa or in the West Indies, the singer would make up a story about certain incidents that took place in the community. If a man whipped his wife every Saturday, somebody would make up a rhyme story about that and set it to music. And they still do that Calypso type of singing in the West Indies and in many places in the United States also. Years ago, when I used to run on ships back in New York, one time I made up a little Calypso song using various foods of the West Indy Islands, and they thought that was a big hit, and I called it He Pawn and Chocolate Tea. And it said, Him don't care much about okra soup, no hopping John for he. But child, him show sure I'm crazy about He Pawn and Chocolate Tea. Anything that was liquid in some of the islands is a uh, tea. Lemon tea, milk tea, iced tea, everything is a tea if it's liquid. And then I went on with different verses telling a whole story, but using the West Indian dialect, that was quite a hit with the men on the ship. Now, I'd like to say something about the early days in slavery in America. Many people believe that the first slave ships arrived in this country in 1619. Actually, the first group of slaves that were brought to this country were almost 100 years before that year, and that was back in 1526. In that year, 500 Spaniards brought a hundred blacks from the West Indy Islands and established a colony in what is now South Carolina. They had a lot of trouble because the Indians in that section were hostile to these people and sickness broke out, uh, some sort of epidemic broke out in the colony and many of the blacks died and also the Spaniards. And then the blacks went berserk and started an insurrection Oh, it was quite bloody. They killed a lot of the Spaniards and vice versa, so that the surviving blacks ran away and joined the surrounding Indian tribes, while uh, I think which was only 100 of the 500 Spaniards that came up there, about 100 remained, and they went back to the West Indies. And so that was the first recorded insurrection that we have on what is now American soil. The first group of slaves who arrived in Jamestown, Virginia, in 1619 also came from the West Indies. They came up in that Dutch man of war, as it was called, but it was a British ship. Now, these Africans had the status of indentured servants, just like many whites and Indians during this period. And after a certain period of time, usually from four to eight years, they were set free. 
Many of the whites from England, Scotland, Ireland came to the colonies around this time and served as indentured servants or contract workers. Right in here, I'd like to tell about two white indentured servants or slaves, as they were sometimes referred to, who made good in this country, as many Americans have since. One of these men was born in Ireland. His name was George Taylor. His father was a minister in Ireland, and he wanted George to go to college and study medicine. And after a few years, he decided that he just wanted to do his thing. And so he left college and went down to the dock and made a deal with the captain of a ship that was headed for Philadelphia. They had two types of white servants. One was called indentured servant. That was a contract worker who would sign a contract to work for four to eight years to have his passageway paid from England or Scotland over to the colonies. And then after he finished the eight years of his contract, he was set free and probably given some land and started his own farm or plantation. Well, now, that was the indentured servant. Then they had what they call a redemptioner. A redemptioner was what this boy did, Taylor. George said to the captain, listen, I have an uncle in Philadelphia. I don't have any money now, but if you take me to Philadelphia, my uncle will be there to meet the ship and redeem me. And the captain said, all right. So he took George and when he arrived at Philadelphia and the other people were getting off the ship, the captain says, where's your uncle, son? And George says, oh, by the way, I guess he's not coming. In fact, I don't have an uncle over here. And the captain probably knew that because other people had pulled that trick on him before. And so he sold George to other white people who came down to the boat to buy indentured servants or to redeem people. George was sold just as my grandmother, who was a slave in Virginia, was sold. This man who bought George took him to uh, his home, and he had an iron foundry. And George was put in the uh, department where he would stoke the furnace and build the fire for smeltering the iron. Then the other white servants, indentured servants also, saw the calluses forming on this young man's hands because he hadn't been used to that type of work, of course studying medicine as he had been. And so they went to the foreman, the boss, uh, their master, and told him that this boy was not used to that type of work and that when they talked to him, his English was so high above theirs that they didn't understand what he was talking about most of the time. So the boss called George in his office and gave him an audition, asked him uh, about his ability to work in the office. And he found out that George knew everything, knew a whole lot more about business than he did. And so after a few years, this man died, the owner died, and George married his wife and took over the iron business. And then after that, he sold the home where the wife lived and moved into the city and built a big mansion and went into politics. And he advanced into politics to the point where when we were having the delegations from the colonies to sign our Declaration of Independence. This man was a, one of the delegation from Pennsylvania, right along with Ben Franklin and all the big shots who signed for the Pennsylvania delegation. And if you will look on your uh, Declaration of Independence, you will find the name of George Taylor with the delegation from Pennsylvania, a slave who was able to sign the declaration. The other man, George Walton, was born in Virginia, and his family sold him supposedly uh, as an apprentice, but they had so many children, I guess, they sold him to a man who was a real Simon Legree. He was so mean, mean to Walton. He wouldn't let him study. Walton wanted to try to educate himself by studying at the fireplace at night. This man wouldn't let him do that, wouldn't let him have oil for the lamps. And so George had to go out and chop wood in the daytime and hide and then make a fire and study by the fireplace. So finally, when his eight years were over, he went down to Georgia and began to study law under a lawyer. In those days, you see, you didn't study law in school as we do now. You studied with another lawyer. And so George studied with a lawyer until he worked himself up where he became a lawyer. And uh, he went into politics also. 
and he was a, an officer in the Revolutionary War. Then, when the war was over, he came back into politics. He was twice governor of the state of Georgia, and I think three times in the legislature of that state. There's a monument in Atlanta for this man. He also was on the small delegation that signed the Declaration of Independence representing the state of Georgia. Well, now, here's an example of two white men who were slaves in this country, just as my grandmother was a slave, but who pulled themselves up by their bootstraps to the point where they became signers of our Declaration of Independence. Regardless of what color you are, there's an opportunity for you somewhere in this country. I'm so happy to say that. By the year 1630, there were free blacks in Virginia with farms of their own and with white folks working for them in Virginia. A lot of white people I meet tell me uh, that their ancestors came over on the Mayflower. And I say to them, well, now that's nice, because when your ancestors were passing Virginia on the way up to Plymouth, Massachusetts, we were standing on the shores of Virginia waving at you because we were already here. We came over in 1619, you know. Now, one reason that our first slaves on what is now American shores were whites and Indians was the fact that we didn't have any blacks over here to speak of after 1619, after this first boatload. Very few slaves came over. And uh, so your first crop, commercial crop, was tobacco. The Indians taught John Smith how to grow tobacco, and then they sent it on over to the Virginia Company, and it became commercial, so they had to have help to grow this tobacco. And that's when white people were uh, recruited all through England and Scotland and, and the British Isles to go to the colonies to work. Many of the people came over with a broom, thinking they could sweep gold off the streets. Well, they came over not expecting to do the hard work they had to do when they got there, and so... Uh, they were treated just as slaves. John Smith, in his notes, says that they had to march them to the tobacco fields by guns in the mornings. But tobacco was their only crop. It wasn't until the beginning of the 18th century, in 1700, that indigo and rice became commercial crops. And then that's the time that they began to go to Africa and rape Africa and bringing these blacks in because they needed more help. And by 1710, you see, two-thirds of uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina were black in just 10 years. As more slaves were brought into the colonies in the second half of the uh, 17th century, their status as indentured servants for eight years began to wane. So now, you see, it became almost impossible for these slaves to gain their freedom. It was during this period that slavery was established as an institution in this country. Now, the first thing that the slave owner had to do was to break the blacks, just like uh, one breaks a horse, so they would be useful to him as a servant. And when you uh, begin that, the first thing you do is to break a man's spirit. If you break his spirit and his religion, then you've got him. All people believe in something. They can call it God, you, you call it whatever it is, but all people, primitive or not, believe in some supernatural being. There is some supernatural being over all of us, from prehistoric man on down. But if you can convince him and show him that his religion and his God is inferior to your God, then you have broken his spirits. We brought these slaves over here. We as Caucasians, I'm talking now. When we brought these slaves over here, we told them, now your God is not worth a dime. If he had been worth anything, he wouldn't have permitted us to come over there and capture you, you see. So you have to worship our God now because he's a compassionate being and he's loving, and he's kind. And if you're an obedient servant and go about your business and do what you're told to do, perhaps you can go to our heaven and live on, uh, well, maybe the watch side of our heaven. Who knows? 
Then we went about the business of breaking their spirits, making them feel inferior by using every method we thought would be effective. For instance, you're walking down the street and uh, you see a little white cat cross you and you say, oh, isn't that a pretty little cat? You go a little further and a little yellow cat cross you and you say, oh, I wish I had that darling little kitten. Isn't it something? And a few steps more, a black cat dashes across you and right away you want to start throwing salt over your shoulder, your left shoulder, to ward off the bad luck of the black cat. Why couldn't you throw salt at the white cat and the yellow cat? But the black cat is black and therefore is bad luck. You having a bad business week and nothing is going to right for you, so you say you're behind the eight ball. All the other balls on the table, I don't know how many there are, I don't play the game, but I know there are a lot of balls on the pool table and in pretty colors, but the eight ball is the one that gives you bad luck. You got a son that doesn't conform to the establishment of the rest of the members of the family, and you say, well, he's the black sheep of our family. How come he couldn't be a white sheep? Just because he doesn't conform to the establishment, he's got to be black. You see, then you can't find something. You put some money down. You say, uh, Nellie, have you found a hundred dollar bill I left this morning on the table? No. George, do you know where it is? No. A wife, do you know where it is? No. Well, now look, there's a nigger in the wood pile here somewhere. Well, how come it couldn't be an Irishman in the wood pile? How, why does it have to be a nigger in the wood pile? Well, now all that piles up. The only thing that, that I can think of when you have a good business year, you say your business is in the black. And uh, that, that puts a little human touch to it, I guess, maybe. But anyway, if you kick a dog enough times, then you break that dog's spirit so you see his tail drop and he's no good. He slinks away from you. And so we tried to break their spirits, but it was their music, their music that we couldn't break. We had to make these slaves feel inferior. And when we felt that we had done that, then we knew we had them. The African in Africa didn't feel inferior. I found a story some 40 years ago about this same thing. An Englishman was telling his experience uh, about his missionary work among the savages during the 19th century and his effort to teach these people the English culture and English religion. So it seems that he had been there 10 years trying to train these people, but uh, something came up back home, and he had to go to England. And he went on home, and uh, when he came back, he didn't let these people know on what day he was going to arrive. So when he came back to the tribe after having been away on this mission, he found all the people in the center of the village gathered around their priest. The head of their religion they called a priest, just as Catholics and Presbyterians, Episcopals call their head a priest. But we say he's a witch doctor because he isn't a Christian. However, they were all around this witch doctor listening to what he had to say. The minister said, he's speaking in the first person, you know, and he said, when I arrived at the village, they were so interested in what the uh, witch doctor was having to say that uh, they didn't realize I was among them. So I stood there on the outskirts of the group to listen to what the witch doctor had to say. I found out that he was telling the uh, people, giving them his idea of the creation. So I wanted to stand and wait to see how well he had gotten the stories that I had been telling them for 10 years. And the witch doctor says, it happened like this. Adam and Eve were in the garden. And the Lord said, now Adam, You and Eve can have access to everything in this garden. I have given you uh, access to these coconut trees here. There are a whole lot of lovely coconut trees. But that coconut over here, that tree over here on the right, you see that tree? And they say, yes, sir, we see it. So that tree is my tree. You all let that one alone. You can have bananas here. You have access to all the birds in the air, the fish in the sea and in the streams. You can eat that. You can use the animals for food and for beasts of burdens. And you all have a good time. Now, I'll be back in a little while. Enjoy yourself. They said, goodbye, Lord. As soon as the Lord had gone out of sight, Eve said, Adam, I certainly would like to have one of those coconuts. Adam said, sure. He started up one of the coconut trees that the Lord had given him. She said, from that tree over there, Adam. And Adam said, well, Eve, you heard the Lord saying that at that tree, Adam. 
He said, oh, girl, we can't do that. The Lord will be, I want that tree. So that fool went up that tree, got that coconut, came down, split it open. And the minute they drank the milk from the coconut tree, they looked down at their bodies and they were so ashamed. Said, good gracious, we got clothes on. What's wrong with us? And just about that time, they heard the voice of the Lord coming. And the Lord said, uh, Adam and Eve, I want to see y'all. I forgot something here I wanted to tell you. And they ran and hid. So we can't come out, Lord. He said, you can't come out. What's wrong? You can't come out. So we, we have clothes on. You have clothes on. Who told you you had clothes on? We know it, Lord. He says, "Uh uh-huh. You've broken my rule. I haven't been gone 15 minutes now, and you've broken my rule already. And just for that, I'm going to cast upon you the worst curse I could ever cast on any human being. From now, throughout eternity, you and all your descendants shall be white. (laughs) It's a matter of who's on first at the time, you see. In Africa, black is the color to be, just as in China, with 850 million Chinese, yellow is the color to be. And they feel like men in China because everybody's yellow. If we tell people God can only reach them or they can only reach God by being white, then I think we miss the boat somewhere. So you see, the slave in Africa didn't feel inferior to anybody because he wasn't inferior. The early songs of the slaves in America were based on the culture that they brought over here from Africa. Drums, which were so important in Africa, were brought over by the slaves or else they were made by them after they uh, arrived in their new environment. For a while, the slaves were permitted to play these drums and sing their songs in the slave quarters. At first, the slave owners said, well... If the slaves can work all day long in the fields and still have enough energy to play and sing a few hours at night before they go to bed, then we feel they're entitled to that. Then some slave owner would wake up one morning and find two or three slaves gone. And they found out that these slaves were sending messages on those talking drums to other plantations, telling each other about their escape plans. And as early as 1660, Virginia forbade any more playing of drums for this very reason. They took our drums away, but they couldn't take our music that was within our hearts, and they couldn't take our rhythm away. We still created new songs, and we still could clap our hands and tap our feet, and that's just what we did. We did exactly that. The early slaves sang songs in their native languages. After they learned some English, They began to drop some of the African words and substitute the new English words they had learned. A friend of mine from Louisiana gave me a little song which he had learned as a child. It contained only two English words. This was a children's song and would be sung by a child playing with his friends hide and seek. He would be it, you see. He would cover his eyes and say... uh, just two English words. Then he'd sing that two or three times and then go out and try to find his friends in this little game. I found an interesting song, and this one also is a children's song. It had only one African word left. All the rest were English. The song is called Sangaree. If I live, Sangaree, don't get killed, Sangaree, I'm going back, Sangaree, to Jacksonville, Sangaree, oh babe, Sangaree, oh babe, Sangaree, oh babe, Sangaree, oh babe, Sangaree, chicken in the field, Sangaree, scratching up peas, Sangaree, dog on the outside, Sangaree, scratching off fleas, Sangaree and so forth. Now here's the story that goes with this song. The story says that in Africa many years ago there was an ugly old lady who was crippled and all wrinkled, face emaciated and so forth. She was alone in the jungle and one day an eagle came down and said to her, you know what, I'd like to make a deal with you old lady. 
I can make you a very pretty young woman and make you the head of a very nice village if you will permit me to lay my eggs in this tree up here and hatch my family. And the old lady said, you think you can do that, sure enough? And the eagle says, oh, yes, I can do that if you can keep your side of the bargain. And so the old lady said, well, I certainly keep my side of the bargain. So then the eagle said, sangaree. And the minute she said sangaree, all the trees disappeared from that part of the jungle. And she said sangaree the second time, and the houses appeared. And she said sangaree the third time, and the village was filled with good-looking people, young and old, middle-aged people, but all fine-looking people. And this woman was young again, and she, had, she was the head of the village. So one day, one of her children went to a tree, and he heard the little eaglets up in the tree making noises. And he wanted to eat one of those eagles. And he came to his mother, and he said, Mother, I'd like to get permission to cut that tree down so I could eat one of those eaglets. And the mother said, Oh, you can't do that. I made a, a deal with those eaglets' mother. You mustn't bother that tree at all. And then the little boy began to cry, you know, and whined and said, Oh, no, I, I'm going to die. If I can't eat that eagle, I'm going to die. And the mother said, Well, don't die. I don't want you to die. So you can just have one now, just one. Remember that. So he and his friends went out, and they chopped on the tree, and the little eaglets began to cry, and their mother came. The mother flew down to the tree, and she yelled out, screeched out, and the little boys, they ran away. But the next day, the boys came, and they started chopping away at the tree again. And the little eaglet, one of them fell out this time, and they captured it and roasted it and ate it. And they chopped some more. They wanted some more hoggish, you know, so they wanted another one. And they began to chop that tree. The little eaglets up there got confused, and they began to scream, you know, even though their mother told them not to. Mother heard them and said, Sangaree! And when she said, Sangaree, all the people disappeared from this village. She said, Sangaree the second time, and all the houses vanished. And the third time she said, Sangaree, the jungle reappeared, and there was this old woman, old and ugly and emaciated and crippled again. The eagle put her family on her back, and she flew down past the old woman, and she said, I have some advice for you, old lady, and I hope it will help you in the future. When someone has done something good for you, please don't repay them with evil. And then the eagle flew off. Now, here's the way the Africans told their golden rule. We say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And they said it a different way, but it all means the same thing. Although I knew the story behind the song, I didn't know what the word sangaree meant until I talked to a professor in the music department of the University of Ghana. I said, Kwabena, have you ever heard of the word sangaree? You see, I was waiting to find out just what part of uh, Africa this song came from, so I didn't give him any leads at all. And after thinking a little while, he said, yes, I think I have. That sounds like one of our words. It means a big bird like an eagle, doesn't it? And I said, yes, it sure does. That's right. That's just what it means. So evidently the story originated somewhere in that part of Africa. As the slaves sang the song over and over, they continued to add new English words that they had learned until finally all that was left of the original song, African song, was the one word sangaree. And it's still sung on the islands off the uh, coast of South Carolina and Georgia. Now here's another song, a children's song. And it's the first song I remember in my whole life. It's called Swing a Lady Gum Pump. My mother used to say Swing a Lady Um Pump. But I've changed it to Gum Pump because I thought that was a little easier to say. It has three cute little verses in it. And the melody goes back and forth between the women and the men. So... Our chorale would like to sing for you now this little children's song, Swing a Lady Gum Pum. Oh, 
mistress promised me when she died she set me free. She lived so long till her head got old and she got out of the notion of dying at all. Oh, swing a lady gump up, swing a lady gump up, swing a lady round. Oh, swing a lady gump up, swing a lady gump up, from a lady round. Raccoon wears a bushy tail, awesome tail is bare. Rabbit ain't got no tail at all, ain't nothing but a little bunch of hair. Oh, swing a lady gump up, swing a lady gump up, swing a lady round. Oh, swing a lady gump up, swing a lady gump up, swing a lady round. Swing a lady gump up, swing a lady gump up, swing a lady, swing a lady, swing a lady, swing a lady, from the lady I'd like to say a few words about the slaves as they tried to make an adjustment to the new environment and language which was forced upon them. It took them quite a long time to learn enough English to really be of service to their owners. Now, because the slaves came from various tribes in Africa, they were many times unable to speak to each other, let alone communicate with their masters. Most of the slaves came from Central West Africa but others came from north and eastern parts of Africa and the Congo and even parts of the Arabic world. You can imagine the problems which arose as a result of the indiscriminate mixing of the different cultures and languages. Suppose, for instance, a slave master would buy 15 or 16 slaves on the market and bring them home to his plantation. The overseer comes down and says, now I want you boys to move that bale of cotton over here. Understand? Now, they don't understand. They don't understand him at all, so they just stand there. You see, y'all hear me? I want you to move that bale of cotton over there. One slave nudges another and says in his language, what in the world is he talking about? This other slave says to him, I don't know what he's talking about, and I don't even understand you, and furthermore, I hate you. You see, his tribe and that tribe been fighting each other for past thousands of years in Africa, and now they're all thrown together. Fifteen men from fifteen different tribes that have been fighting each other over the years, just as people in Europe had been fighting each other. So the master not only has to teach them English as quickly as possible so that he could get a fair amount of work out of them, but he also has to keep them quiet enough so that they won't kill each other in the slave quarters. Can't you imagine an overseer trying to teach a few slaves English after a day's work? Well, he wants to teach them as quickly as possible so they'll have new words that they might have to use the next day. So he calls them together in the evening, and he says to one of them, Nellie, say, put the book on the table. Nellie says, yes, sir. Put the, the, the book on the table. He says, I didn't say the book on the table, fool. I said, put the book on the table. Now say that. She said, yes, sir. I try again, sir. Put the, the book on the table. He said, oh, Lord, have mercy. You slaves are so stupid. George, you said. George said, yes, sir. Put the book on the table. He says, great day in the morning. Going back to the slave quarters. You're all too stupid for me to be bothered with. Now, this is not so. They were not stupid. He was too impatient to find out why they could not say the book as he had said it. He could have found out that there are certain sounds we have in English which they didn't have in their languages. For instance, they had no TH sound in most of their languages from West Africa. Therefore, this was a strange sound to these people. And they were trying seriously to imitate what they thought they heard their master say. They thought they heard him say, put the book, because they had never heard anyone say the or the. Now, you bring the president of France over here and say to him, Mr. President, we have some people here from Ghana who are so stupid, they can't say, put the book on the table. Could you show them how to say that? And he says, certainly. Put the book on the table. <laughs> you see, why? Because there's no TH sound in French. No TH sound in French. They have many words with TH in it, but they don't pronounce them the way we do. T-H-E 
with the little accent over the E is pronounced in French, te, and that's the stuff you drink. We say T, they say te. T-H-E-A-T-R-E. -E. I don't know if we stole that from them or not. We say theater if you pay $25 a seat. Theater if you pay a dollar and a half. They say teatre because they don't have our TH sound in their language. So put the Frenchman with my cousin from Ghana because he can't say it either. You go to Italy, get the president of Italy, and say, Mr. President, we have some stupid blacks here from Nigeria who can't say, put the book on the table. Will you please show them how? He says, certainly, put the book on the table. Why? because there's no T-H sound Italian. Leaning Tower Pisa, paintings, pretty girls, but no T-H sound in Italian. So put him with my cousin from Nigeria. In Germany, the German says, Dear Dies Das, but he doesn't say the book. Many languages don't contain that T-H sound as we know it, and that's why the slaves were having all the trouble pronouncing it. Now here's a little song entitled, The Angels Rolled Dust On Away. In correct English, we would say, The Angels Rolled the Stone Away, because we know that if the article T-H-E precedes a word beginning with a consonant, you say, The Chair, The Book, The Man, The Desk, and so forth. But our grammar, but he did apply the rules as he pronounced his words. He said, I don't know anything about your grammar, sir, but I do know that if I say the angels rolled the stone away, my Adam's apple comes up here and chokes me momentarily. So he says, the angels rolled the stone away. Well, the chorale will now sing this wonderful little song, the angels rolled the stone away.
In this next section, I want to deal with the relationship between the slaves and religion in this country. When the slaves first arrived, they did not belong to the Christian religion. The early slave owner gave the slaves little or no religious training at all because he looked on these people as inventory, the same as he did with his cattle, his wagon, his horse, or whatever he had around the plantation. He saw no reason in the world why he should Christianize these people. All he wanted them to do was to work and behave themselves. After a while, the missionaries came on plantation wanting to teach the slaves about Christianity. And the master would say, no, you stay away from my plantation. And then the missionary would say, well, the king of England told us we had to come. The slave owner said, well, Christianity speaks of brotherhood and we're not their brothers. So we don't want you to give them any Christianity or anything else. Then the slave owners made another point. They said, now look here, you remember between the days of the Crusaders in the 11th and 12th centuries up to the revolt of Martin Luther, there grew up in Europe at that time a gentleman's agreement that no Christian could keep another Christian as a slave. A lot of people still hold to that gentleman's agreement. We're not gonna let you Christianize these people because they will become our brothers and then we'll have to let them go and lose the huge investments we have in them. Well, finally the slave owners relented a bit and said, well, now we'll make a deal with you. You can come on the plantation if you want to and give them just a little Christianity, but play it low key, mind you. Don't tell them anything about that brotherhood mess because we're not their brothers. You just tell them, slave, obey your master. And that if we have to whip them every now and then, it's for their own good. Obey your master, obey the master's wife, and you go to heaven. And if you don't obey, they're going into a different direction. That's all you must tell them. So the missionaries went to work. It was around the middle of the 18th century before they were given any sort of Christianity to amount to anything, and the missionaries came on the plantation and gave them that. So many of the missionaries compromised with the slave owners and did not say anything about brotherhood. They were told they must be general slaves and not run away from the plantation. They were told, our God is much more powerful than your gods in Africa. Your gods in Africa are no good. Our God sees everything you do and he hears everything you say, especially if two or three of you get together and decide you're going to run away from the plantation. He hears that and writes all of it down, either for you or against you. And he says, uh, uh-huh. I see we got a few militants down there already. <laughs> now, there's a little song which contains this idea of God writing what he sees you do. The song is called, My Lords Are Writing All The Time. And here's the way the little song goes. He sees all you do and he hears all you say. My Lords are writing all the time. Oh, he sees all you do and he hears all you say. My Lords are writing all the time. Well, I ain't been to heaven, but I've been told. My Lords are writing all the time. That the streets up there are paved with gold. My Lords are writing all the time. The slave owner told his slaves, you must sing these songs that will help you be a good slave and a good servant. So around the middle of the 18th century, they began to create songs like this. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. That's a beautiful song, very seldom sung nowadays, but that came along in this period. Here's another one. This one is very, very old also. 
Uh, you can imagine an old slave thinking about what her master said about our God, African gods being no good. And she's trying to get adjusted to this white God now. She's sitting in the cabin thinking about this situation. And uh, she'd been told to pray to this white God. And the little children are down on the floor, different ages, making noises, doing their things. And she says to him, hush, hush. Somebody's calling my name. Hush, Lord, it will hush. Will now somebody's calling my name. Hush, Lord, it hush. Will now somebody's calling my name. Oh, my Lord, oh, my Lord, what shall I do? She thinks she hears the white God calling her and admonishing her about something she's done. There's another song which came around that same time. And although it's not being sung much today, it's called Give Me Jesus. It's a very fine little song. The song says, In the morning when I rise, In the morning when I rise, In the morning when I rise, Give me Jesus. And then the last part it says, You may have all this world, Give me Jesus. But then they looked around, talking about the slaves, after singing a song like this, they looked around and saw the way their masters were treating them. And the older and wiser they became, the less they agreed with what the song had to say. Now, the modern black has nothing at all against Jesus or Christian religion. But having given his life and his blood and his sweat to make this country what it is from the day the country started, he feels that he's entitled to a better home, better standard of living and a better slice of the American pie in general. So they don't sing this song anymore. This goes on the shelf. During the last part of the 18th century, the slaves were permitted to attend some of the white churches. So as long as they sat in the balcony, of course, it was all right. Many Presbyterians allowed the slaves to attend the worship service, and sometimes the minister would be preaching, and he would say something that created an, an emotional response from the slaves. And one of the slaves would suddenly yell out, Amen! Amen! Well, you know, some of the Presbyterians, <laughs> some of those old Presbyterians didn't think that was proper thing at all to do during a church service. Up in the balcony, the slaves many times would clap their hands and beat out the rhythms of the uh, hymns that were being sung. They were just beating them out in a futile effort to liven them up a little bit. As you recall, percussion instruments and rhythm were an important aspect of the African music tradition which they brought with them to America. Like the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, the slave would sing that in church, and it would sound like this. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. <laughs> He'd sing it, then he would look around at another slave and say, Man, ain't that sad? <laughs> they liked the words, but that tune had to go. So they sang it like they wanted it and put some life in it. Come the fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise on my loving brother and so forth. It put a little bit of life in that old dead song. Well, sir, and it did too. Some of the church members didn't appreciate that kind of raucous behavior, though. So at one of the Presbyterian meetings, they voted to put the slaves out of church. And the discontentment that came as a result of that almost broke up the Presbyterian church in Virginia. The slaves even made up songs about it to express their utter confusion at being taken into the church and then all of a sudden being put out again. 
this little song, which expresses this feeling, says, Oh, Lord, I done done. Oh, Lord, I done done. Oh, Lord, I done done. I done done what you told me to do. You told me to pray. I done that too. Well, I done done what you told me to do. You told me to sing. I done that too. I done done what you told me to do. And so they expressed it. They said, good gracious, what's wrong with these white folks? They told us to pray, told us to sing, told us to try to be good. We did that. Clap our hands a little bit and then out of the church, out we go. That's something. Many people in the early white churches couldn't read and write. And so when they sang hymns, they did what they called lining it out. One person would sing or recite the first couple of lines of a song, and then everybody would learn it by rote. Sometimes they intoned the melody like a Catholic priest, and then the people would sing it in the appropriate meter, common meter, short meter, long meter, and so forth. In a particular church, Sister So-and-So would have four or five songs, which she alone would lead. Brother so-and-so would have a certain number of songs, which he would lead. When the blacks began to start their own churches, they did the same thing. This system has lasted from the 17th century up until this very day, where it is still used in some rural churches. When I was a youngster, my folks used to tell about an old minister, a jackleg preacher they called him, who had no church of his own. And he went around from community to community preaching at different churches. He came to preach at this one particular church, and the regular minister got up and introduced him. He says, now, uh, I want you brothers and sisters to give Reverend so-and-so here your undivided attention. He's going to bring us the message this morning. So the minister got up, cleared his throat, said, uh, brothers and sisters, my eyes are dim. I cannot see. I did not bring my specs with me. Old Sister Johnson sitting over there on the row on the right thought he was lying out of him. So she jumped up and said, come and meet her. My eyes are dim. I cannot see. I did not bring my specs with me. Well, so the minister thought to himself, oh, my, my, what have I done here now? So he tried to get him to stop, held up his hand and said, uh, brothers and sisters, I did not mean it for him. I only meant my eyes were dim. <laughs> and right on into the verse, he went, I did not mean it for him. I only meant my eyes were dim. It took him a half hour to get him to stop. Because as long as he said it in rhyme, they were going to keep on lining it out. <laughs> and that's what this practice of lining out is all about. I want the chorale now to sing a song which demonstrates the type of music which could have been sung in black slave churches. Sometimes I conjure up a situation and make an appropriate story to go along with the song if I can't find the authentic story. The little story which goes with this song will, I hope, put the song in proper perspective for you. The song is called Hold On. Keep your hand on the plow and hold on. I imagine this song was done in the revival meetings in the churches. During the 18th century, in the Baptist church, they had what they called the mourner's bench. Later, the mourner's bench was found in the Methodist church as well as in the Presbyterian church. Presbyterians, by the way, called it the anxious seat. You know, they had to dignify it. Well, this seat was the first bench in the church with the white slave owners. And the slaves, in creating their own churches, had their own mourner's bench also. During the church meeting, the minister would ask, who is not afraid or ashamed to come up here to the front and let us pray for him? Then maybe some lady would be able to get her sinful husband to come up. So the entire church would pray for him. Next, the minister would preach to him and try to persuade him to join the church. He preached the doctrine of hellfire and damnation. You either walked the straight and narrow path or down you went. At one point in the service, one of the deaconesses over in the amen corner would come over to this person on the morning's bench. And she'd say, the only way, son or daughter, that you will be able to reach heaven is to keep your hand on the plow. 
when this lady spoke about the plow, she was using symbolism. And to her, the plow was symbolic of Jesus Christ. So she says, listen here, honey. If you're plowing with a plow in the field and you hold on firmly to the handles and press down hard, you get a straight furrow. But if you take one hand off that plow and say, hello, cousin John, waving, you know, hello, cousin Mary, that plow is going to wiggle, honey, and you'll be going down the wrong path. So that is the idea this sister is trying to get across to the sinner. The only way to be a good working Christian is to keep your mind on Jesus Christ all the time. That's holding on to the plow. Pronounced correctly, this song would be hold on, hold on. But the slave did not say that. He didn't say that because it had a weak sound to him. In order to convey the power that he wanted, he said, hold on. H-O-L hyphen D-O-N connected the D of hold with the O of on. You see? And that gave the feeling of strength and power. So now we'd like to do this Jubilee song entitled, Keep Your Hand on the Plow and Hold On. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on, hold on. No run, no run, let me come in. The doors all fasten and the windows spin. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on, hold on. No rust said you done lost your track. Well, you can't plow straight and keep a looking back. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. The many frustrations and injustices which were a part of the slave experience found their way into the folk songs and poems of the times. There were laws preventing anyone from teaching these slaves how to read or write, and I can understand why now. I don't care what race a man belongs to or what his color is. You can't educate a man and then keep him as a slave. Once he is educated, he can figure out how to get rid of you just as well as you can figure out how to keep him as a slave. Quite often the slaves would put some of their personal feelings in these songs. 
let's say, for instance, they were sick and tired of slavery, of the slavery institution, period, and wanted to protest against it in a song. Now, they knew that if they had something negative to say about their master, they could not just go out on the street corner and make that announcement. And so they found out by trial and error that they could make this same protest if they put it in a religious song and sang hallelujah or praise the Lord every now and then. These songs which carried the protests or secret messages I call telegraph songs, and they usually fit into certain forms. First, the slaves would sing a few nonsense verses at the beginning of the song so that the master would say, uh, oh, my, my, just listen to them down there. They're just like little children. Their songs don't mean much, but I guess they're having a good time. Then comes this verse with all the vinegar he wanted to put into it. Finally, they put two, three little molasses verses at the end, and that was basically the form of a telegraph song. If you remember a little while ago, I talked about the blacks being thrown out of the church because they wanted to sing and shout and clap their hands. Now, the slaves couldn't publicly grumble or express their resentment at being put out of the church, but they created a little song that went like this. Oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you moan. Oh, Mary, don't you weep, don't you moan, cause Pharaoh's army got drowned. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. That was the chorus. Now, the first verse says, One of these mornings, bright and fair, I'm going to take my wings and cleave the air, cause Pharaoh's army got drowned. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. Now, next comes the verse that they wanted to get across all their resentment at being thrown out of church. This verse says this. When I get to heaven, going to sing and shout, be nobody up there to turn me out, cause Pharaoh's army got drowned. Oh, Mary, don't you weep. What they meant was that when they got up to heaven, <laughs> there wouldn't be <laughs> any old mean white people up there at all. Be nothing but God-fearing blacks. All the time they were singing, the master and his wife would be sitting on the front porch, he drinking his mint julep and she sewing or knitting and listening to those songs of those sweet little songs down there. <laughs> if they only knew what they were really singing about. Many slaves were told that they should pray to God and try to become obedient servants. These slaves prayed. They tried to do what they thought was right. And they were still beaten, mistreated and many times separated from other members of their families. Take another situation. A wife could be sold from a husband and children sold and taken from their parents, never to see them again. The slaves recognized these inconsistencies between what they were hearing people talk about in church and what they saw actually happening. So they wanted to put this idea into song form. Here's a little song they made up for this purpose. The song is called I got shoes. Now, the first part goes this way. I got shoes. You got shoes. All God's children got shoes. When they get to heaven, going to put on my shoes, going to walk all over God's heaven. 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 You see, these slaves couldn't, couldn't tell their master, Master, you telling me one thing, and then you're living something else. The master would think they were crazy and sell them off quick so they wouldn't contaminate the other slaves with that type of attitude. So they put those feelings in the middle of the song and said, Everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Heaven, heaven, shout all over God's heaven. You see, they said, just because you talk about brotherhood and being nice doesn't mean it's going to do you any good unless you live out what you talk about. Now, there's another little telegraph song called Gospel Train. And the message that was conveyed in this song was that there's no difference between black and white so far as God is concerned. All men are brothers. Now, but they couldn't go up to the master and say, Master, you my brother. But they wanted to express that idea. And they wanted to tell each other. So they created this song. The song says, Oh, get on board, little children, get on board, little children, get on board, little children, there's room for many or more, the gospel train is coming, 
I hear it just at hand. I hear them car wheels rumbling and moving through the land. Now get on board. Now here is the verse that gets across their message. The message is that all men are alike. The fare is cheap and all can go. The rich and poor are there. No second class on board this train. No difference in the fare. And now get on board, little children, and so forth. And white people back then would sing the song right along with the blacks, and they never knew the real meaning of the words. The song we'd like to demonstrate now is not a telegraph song, but it is a nonviolent protest song. The song is called Going Down That Lonesome Road. I want to tell you a story about this song so that it will aid you in your understanding of it. Now, here's a young man, a slave on the plantation. He's about 18 or 19 years old, and he works all day long picking cotton or growing tobacco, whatever his master's doing. I used to ask my grandmother, you know, when I was a child, I used to ask her, Grandma, uh, how long did you slaves have to work in a day? What was your working condition? You weren't union, were you? And she said, no, son, we work from kin to kink. Now, when I'm in certain parts of the country, I have to translate that. If I'm in another part of the country, nearly everybody, white and black, understand it. It means from the time you can see the sun until you cannot see the sun. <laughs> well, it's about 5 o'clock in the early evening, and this young man has to go down in the meadow to get the cows, eight cows his master owns, and bring them back up so that some other slaves can milk them when he gets them up there. So we see him walking along this dusty road, going on down, and he has his little dog along beside him to help him get the cows out of the bushes. You know, cows can be pretty ornery sometimes, and even if you put a bell on them, they will often stand perfectly still so you can't tell where they are. So his little dog runs into the bushes, nips one on the leg, and says, get out of there, you hear the man calling you. So he's walking down this road, and it's getting darker and darker, almost twilight, and he's whistling. He really doesn't realize he's whistling because he's merely thinking about this situation he finds himself involved in. He says, here I am, 19 years old. I've been a slave all my life. My mother's a cook at the big house. She's a slave just like her mother before. And my great-grandmother was captured in Ghana and brought over here. So four generations of us have given our lives to this family on this plantation for nothing. This morning as I started to work, I heard the master talking to a friend of his, and they were talking about how our money had E Pluribus Unum written on it. That's right, E Pluribus Unum, all for one. That is, if you're not a slave. Now, I believe that's bad. That's a bad situation. I believe that this bad situation is not going to exist forever. And this young man was right. Along came Abraham Lincoln with one stroke of his pen, freed four million of us. So this young man sees hope. He sings a protest song without the violence and hatred. He says, I know that conditions like this cannot exist in this country. I'm going down that lonesome road, but I won't be treated this way. So the chorale now sings, going down that lonesome road.
said, I won't see my baby no more, no more, but I won't be treated this away. Well, then, spring's on my bed, I'm broken down, say, then, spring's on. Springs on my bed, I'm broken down, but I won't be treated this way. Then kicked all around this old town. The beginning of the 19th century saw a tremendous increase in slave insurrections in our country. These events were headliners in the papers of the North as well as the South. And thousands of panic-stricken slaveholders moved from the plantations into the cities, uh, like Richmond, Charleston, and so forth. By 1810, there were 91,286 free blacks in the North alone. They were runaways mostly. The slaveholders wanted to get rid of these free blacks. This may strike you as uh, being very interesting or being very shocking. Many free blacks themselves owned slaves. I have found in my research in uh, 1830, practically all of the existing states had free blacks who owned slaves. I even found three families of Hairston's three black families of Harrisons in Virginia who owned slaves. I don't know whether I was one of their slaves or one of the ones who owned black slaves or not, but uh, the majority of the blacks who owned slaves were in uh, Louisiana. Sometimes they were given their freedom by their master. Master, perhaps at the coming to the end of his life, wanted to uh, do something nice, thinking that would help him to get into heaven, would set his slaves free. Others bought their freedom from their masters, and then some just ran away and so forth. There grew up around this time a society for the colonization of free people of color. Uh, it was organized in 1816. Thomas Jefferson was an advocate of this movement, and the first president 
was Bushrod Washington, one of the Supreme Court judges, and the founder was Robert Finley, a Presbyterian minister. These people organized this society and tried to send as many free blacks as they could out of the United States. They went around to places to try to find a, a good situation to send them. Finally, they went over to West Africa and they bought a piece of land over there from the Africans and they called it Liberia. And they named the capital of this land Monrovia after the president of the United States at that time. I think they paid $300 for that piece of land, which we now call Liberia, and mostly in trinkets. And so then they began to recruit free blacks, but they had pretty hard time getting much uh, enthusiasm among the blacks at first. The first boatload went over, had trouble with the uh, weather and so forth, and then uh, subsequently more loads went over. But there was one man, a big American, uh, Richard Allen. Richard Allen was the first bishop of the Methodist Church, but he was put out of the church. He and another man were put out of the Methodist Church, and so he started a church of his own and called it the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Richard Allen was like Martin Luther. He was a leader, a prominent leader of that time, and he was against this movement of going out of the United States going away and going back to Africa. He said, we were brought here in 1690, and here we've been here 200 years, giving our blood, our lives, and our strength to build this country and make it what it is. Now you want us to go back to Africa. If you want us to do that, then you go back to Europe, and we'll give the country back to the Indians we took it from. And so a group of songs grew up around this situation. Deep River, for instance. Deep River, there was a body of water in Virginia called Deep River, small body of water, and also a community. I think they were Quakers, and the blacks were around there. This song could have grown up around this part at that time. They sang, Deep River, my home is over Jordan. The Deep River they were thinking about was the Atlantic Ocean. My home is over Jordan. Jordan is the Atlantic Ocean. My home meant Africa. Oh, don't you want to go to that gospel feast? And so forth. That's the feast that they would have if they ever got back to Africa. And so you have a telegraph song there in Deep River beside a beautiful song. There were other songs. Good news, chariots coming. Good news, chariots coming. Good news, chariots coming. And don't want to leave me behind. They didn't want anything to leave them behind. The chariot, by the way, was not the chariot that we know about, the Roman chariots or the Greek chariots. The chariot the slaves were talking about was a wagon-like vehicle that uh, transported tobacco around the plantations. So they sang, swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home, hoping that the chariot would swing down and get them and swing across the Atlantic Ocean and take them back to Africa. Many songs grew up as a result of this situation in our history. I want to talk now about escape attempts and how music played a part in all this. Slaves sang escape songs as a means of giving messages to each other that they were getting ready to run away from the plantation. You remember that they were not allowed to use drums, so they used songs to get across secret messages to each other. One of the early songs created for this purpose was Steal Away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to 
Jesus day. This was such a nice, quiet song. The master thought the slaves were real religious when they sang it. Steal away home, they would sing. Home was way up north from all the plantation. I ain't got long to stay here. They were running away that night. This song had all the messages of running away. Another song which was used in this same way was Little Black Train. The song goes like this. Oh, Little Black Train is a coming. Get on your business right. Go set your house in order, Lord, for the train may be here tonight. And that meant that they were going to go out tonight on the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman, I don't know how many of you know about Harriet Tubman, but she was a very great person in the history of runaways. She was uh, hit by her slave overseer when she was a young girl. He was trying to punish one of the other slaves, and he threw a hot iron or something at the slave. It missed the slave and hit Harriet and hit her in the face, and so much so that her face was mashed in. And as she grew older, she began to have a kind of a sleeping sickness. She'd come in a room, for instance, and sit down here talking. People would be talking to her, and all at once she'd look to her, and she's dead sleep, and sleep there a couple hours, perhaps. She ran away when she was young and got up north. And when she came back, she had such an easy way in getting up north and such little trouble that she went back and tried to steal some of the other members of her family. And she was. She was successful in stealing many of the members of her family. And then she began to steal other slaves from other plantations, so much so that there was quite a bounty put on her head. And at one time, they were looking for her in all sorts of cities. So one time, she was sitting right in town in the city of Baltimore, and she got tired. She sat down on the curb, and just like that, she went to sleep. She doesn't know how long she'd been sitting, but uh, she was sitting on a piece of newspaper, and when she awoke, there were two men discussing her, and one man said, that looks like the nigger we're looking for. And by this time, she said she stood up and held the paper, just stood up and leaned against the pole. She was standing up there and looking at the paper. When she got up, one of the detectives said, yeah, I believe that's her. And the other detective said, no, that can't be her because the nigga we're looking for can't read. And she's reading the paper. They walked on away and let her alone. And she had the paper upside down. Neither could they read. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Harriet Tubman and a number of other free blacks and whites were a part of the Underground Railroad which helped slaves get from captivity to freedom in the North or Canada. Well, what happened when slaves were able to escape? When slaves escaped, they were often hunted down by white patrollers who hired themselves out to the slave owners. Slaves were required to have passes if they were traveling off the plantation, you know. And if a slave was caught without a pass, he could be arrested and his master would have to pay for his return. Many of the slaves who couldn't speak good English mispronounced the word patrols and instead said patty rollers. After that, the word patty roller was shortened and they were simply called patties. That term is still used by some blacks in reference to whites. There's a famous song that was written about this called Run, Nigga, Run, the Paddle Rolls will Catch You. This song came from that period of time when the patrollers were catching slaves and bringing them back in. Sometimes they would even steal a slave away from one plantation and sell him to someone else on another plantation. Escaping from slavery was not easy, and even when the slaves got away from the plantation, they still had a rough time trying to stay alive, considering the many forces that were against them at that time. Some escaped slaves traveled north in an effort to find freedom. Before the fugitive slave laws, if a slave left the plantation, let's say in Mississippi, uh, and got to Pennsylvania, New York, or Maine, he was free, as long as he got across the Mason-Dixon line. But after the fugitive slave laws of uh, 1850, 
The slave could go up to the highest point in Maine and live, and even if he stayed up there eight or ten years, he could be returned to the plantation if somebody recognized him and turned him in. The police would have to arrest him, and he could be sent right back to where his plantation was. Some slaves who would run away from the plantation would go into the inaccessible swamps filled with alligators and wild animals. Sometimes the slaves would stay in these swamps for years and only come out at night to trade with the poor white people who lived near the edge of the swamp. If a slave owner had several slaves to escape, he would be approached by men who made a business of catching runaway slaves, and they would say, uh, say, listen, I hear that two or three of your slaves got away, Jack and Joe. And the master would say, yes, they, that's right. I haven't seen them for a month. Then they'd say, well, I hear they're somewhere around place somewhere. How much did you pay for them? And he'd say, I paid a thousand dollars a piece for them. They're good workers, but they just keep running away. Then they'd say, well, uh, tell you what we'll do. We'll give you $500 a piece for them, and then we'll catch them. So he'd get $500 for each one of the runaway slaves. Then these men would have to catch them. And if they did, they'd resell them. The slaves who lived in the camps in the swamps were called maroons. There were camps like these in Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and many of the states. I found a song about a slave who lived in the swamps, but who still had a wife and baby back on the plantation. He'd sneak back at night to see how his wife and baby were getting along, and if there was nobody else around, he'd stay a while and visit. He tried to avoid being seen by the other slaves because he knew that if one of them saw him, he'd turn him into the master, hoping to get some kind reward probably a little more cornmeal or fat back at ration time. So one night, this lady's husband comes and scratches on the window to get her attention. She knows that there are other slaves and white patrols looking for him, and so she sings this little song to tell him to be careful. She says, Go away from that window, my honey, my lamb. Go away from that window, I say. The baby's in his crib, and his mammy's standing by, but you can't get your lodge in here. No, no, you can't get your lodge in here. She also has a message for him, which she puts into the next verse. Go away from that window, my honey, my lamb. Go away from that window, I say. Old master's got his gun, and to miss it, you've been sold. But you can't get your lodge in here. No, no, you can't get your lodge in here. Now, she doesn't have time to say Mississippi, so she just says Mississippi. The slaves were very conscious of rhythm, and they never lost the strong feeling of rhythm that they brought from Africa. And so, if there was a clash between the white man's English words and the black man's rhythm, it was the word and not the rhythm that was compromised. I'll tell you another little story about that in a minute. So, through this little song, the wife tells her husband that he can't stay here because people are out looking for him. And so he gets away before the other slaves can reveal that he's there. The next example carries the same idea of a loved one being sold away, which happened so many times during that period of slavery. The girl in this little poem says, Look down, look down that lonesome road. The way are dark and cold. They makes me weep, they makes me mourn, because my love was sold. They had sold her sweetheart from her plantation to another plantation, and she'll never be able to see him again. So she creates this little song. Look down, look down that lonesome road. The way are dark and cold. Now, doesn't that sound like old English? She didn't say the way is dark. The old English would say the way are dark and cold. They makes me weep. They makes me mourn because my love are sold. Oh, can't you hear that turtle dove? Now here she means turtle dove, of course. Oh, can't you hear that turtle dove? What mourns from vine to vine? She mourns like I mourn for my love left many a mile behind. And there you have a very beautiful and authentic folk poem 
which tells you of this young girl's longing for and sorrow at having lost her loved one, sold away. We would like now to present a song which tells the story of an escape attempt. I've made up a story to go along with this little song in an effort to dramatize the plight of these slaves as they were trying to escape. This song is called Wade in the Water. In the first part of this song, these slaves are running away. You have possibly 25 running away, and tied to their shoulders are four or five little children. Usually, slaves ran away in much smaller numbers, three, four, or five at the most, because it was too easy for large groups to be detected and caught. Now, these slaves are running toward the Ohio River that divides Kentucky from Ohio. In the days of slavery, Kentucky was a slave state and Ohio was a free state. The white people in Ohio sent a message across the river on the Kentucky side, and they said, now listen, we can't come over there and get you, but if you can get over here to our side, then we can help you. We'll give you blankets, hot food, and put you on a wagon and take you to another farm. Then they will help you get on up to Canada. That was the Underground Railroad in action. It's nighttime now, and these slaves have been running for hours, and the bloodhounds are after them. And they run into the river. They press their noses and the noses of the little children and go under the water. And the men and the dogs stop at the edge of the river and look. The dogs indicate to their masters that the slaves went into the water at a certain point. So the masters say, well, if we can't have them, the Yankees won't get them. So they shoot out into the water over on the right side. If they hear no one screaming or crying, then they turn and shoot over to the left, and they keep shooting until all the crying and screaming is over. When the slaves think that the dogs have gone, and the men, then they come up out of the water. By this time, many of the slaves have been shot and killed, and all of the babies have drowned. And so they just drop the babies in the water quietly and continue on across the river in the dark. In the second part of the song, the masters decide to go back to see if any of the slaves are still there. So they go back to the river and begin shooting again. But this time, thank God, the slaves are out of gun range. They are too far out in the water, and the bullets can't reach them. So they sing a happy chorus. My God is a mighty man of war. This section is in a major key because they're all happy now. While they are singing, there comes down the river a boat loaded with bales of cotton going on down the Mississippi and down to New Orleans. This boat has side wheels churning up the water and creating swells. And the swells knock the slaves off balance. And you have general confusion and panic. One man can't swim, but maybe his wife can. So he's yelling to her and trying to hold on to her, and she's kicking water in his face trying to save herself. And you have general confusion and screaming, all this is portrayed in the third section by the dissonant notes and the wailing sounds of the women's voices. They're all up high and raspy. In a situation like this, you don't want your singers to produce beautiful tones. They must be raspy. Well, they finally reached the other side of the river. Six made it. Twenty-five started out, and only six made it to the end. The white people go down to the edge of the water and help pull them ashore, put blankets around them, and give them food. One man says to the person sitting beside him, Did your wife make it? No, he says. Did your wife make it? Yes, she made it, but our baby didn't. And so the last movement of this song is a funeral dirge as the six remaining slaves sit on the other side of the river and mourn the loss of their loved ones. The chorale now sings, Wade in the Water.
Now I'd like to discuss dancing and the contribution of the slaves in this area. Dancing and involvement in percussion, whether through playing an instrument, clapping, or stamping a foot, was as important to the slaves in America as it was in Africa. Dancing accompanied singing as a means of entertainment, and the slaves even used movement in some of their worship services. One movement they used was called the ring shout, and it consisted of a circle of people moving single file, singing and at the same time stamping their feet and clicking their heels. Because the Protestants at that time were against dancing, the ring shout was performed in such a way that one foot never crossed the other. In this manner, you see, they figured no one would accuse them of dancing. The end result was an attempt to preserve the traditional forms of African worship in a new environment. Now, this ring shout was usually performed in the meeting house way down in the swamps and late at night. Many of our American dances were created by the black people. Most plantations were isolated, you see, from the cities and the master and his family couldn't get to the theater. So the only entertainment the white people had was the entertainment of the black slaves. Some white entertainers from the North visiting the plantations in the South and observing the slave entertainers realized quickly the commercial value of this form of entertainment. Then they went back North, blacked their faces and painted their lips white or yellow and exaggerated the dialect of the slaves all out of proportion in order to get laughs from their audiences. The form of the white minstrel show was a semicircle of men. The two downstage men on either side of the circle were the leading comedians. They were called Mr. Tam and Mr. Bones. Mr. Tam got his name because he played a tambourine. Mr. Bones played the hard bones of an animal. Mr. Tam's name later degenerated into Mr. Ham. In the center sat the master of ceremonies, Mr. Interlocutor. He was dressed in a full dress white suit and all the men in the company wore straw hats. Immediately after the opening numbers, then Mr. Interlocutor got up and said, after he said, gentlemen, be seated. The man sat down. Then Mr. Interlocutor got up and said, Mr. Ham, who is that lady I saw you with last night? And Mr. Ham said, Mr. Interlocutor, that wasn't no lady, that was my wife. And then everybody, yuck, 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 yuck. And those stupid jokes like that, I'm sure they got from observing black slaves on the plantations. I found recently quite a number of what was called tall tales. These were funny jokes the slaves used to entertain themselves as they sat outside their cabins in the slave quarters. And probably some of these white entertainers from the North heard some of the jokes. And I'll tell one or two of them now so that you can see the similarity between the original jokes of the slaves and the jokes that the uh, white entertainers used. For instance, say, what is the tallest man you ever see? And the other slave says, well, the tallest man I ever seen was getting a haircut in heaven and a shoe shine in hell. <laughs> and then they'd laugh like that. And another one would say, say, look here, who's the shortest man you ever seen? The shortest man I ever seen could sit on a dime with his feet hanging down. <laughs> and that was joking, you see. Oh, yes, here's one I found. One slave asks the other. Say, uh, what's the runnin'est wagon you ever seen? The other slave says, well, the runnin'est wagon I ever seen belonged to my uncle. That wagon ran over Monday, killed Tuesday, crippled Wednesday, put Thursday in the hospital, and told Friday to tell Saturday to meet him at the funeral at 2 o'clock on Sunday. <laughs> we were discussing original American dances. One dance created by the slaves was called the chalk walk. Two couples start at opposite ends of the room and all have a container or a small bucket of water on top of their heads. There's a chalk line down the middle of the floor between the couples. As the music begins, the couples begin to move down the chalk line toward each other, dancing as they go. The couple who could improvise the best dance and spill the least amount of water would win the prize. After the Civil War, 
when the blacks went into minstrels, the chalk line walk became what we know to be the cakewalk. And there was the beginning of that dance form. What actually happened furthermore was that large groups of black minstrels had formed on several plantations, on many of the plantations, together, and they had worked their dances and their shows together. And so when they came off and were permitted to do shows of their own, they had their companies formed. Now, the minstrel, the form of the minstrel, had already been established by the white minstrel, that is, the interlocutor and Mr. Tam and Mr. Bones and the semicircles. So the blacks had to conform to the form of the minstrels. And so they blacked their faces, just like the white people had blacked their faces and painted their lips. The blacks did the same, imitating the white people, imitating them. And so they came on, and by uh, 1890, they had run the white minstrels off the stage altogether. All the minstrels in the country were black minstrels by that time. We have next a little dance song we called Hold My Mule While I Dance Josie. The words of this song are from an old slave folk poem, and the music is original. Since I was unable to find a story that went with the lyrics, I've made up one which I think will help you to get into the spirit of the song and the dance behind it. So here's the way the story goes. It's two o'clock on Saturday afternoon on the plantation, and the harvest is all in. This young man, about 18 or 19 years old, asks his master if he might borrow one of the mules and go down to another plantation to see his girlfriend, Nellie Brown. And the master says, yes, you can borrow it, but you be sure to be back here in two hours and a half because someone else might want to borrow the mule and go in another direction. So he gets on his mule and heads down the road, anxious to see Miss Nellie Brown. All of a sudden, he looks over to the left, and there's a group of boys and girls his same age on another plantation having a dance party, and they're doing a new dance called the Josie Dosie. Well, he forgets all about Miss Nellie Brown and pulls up the reins on the mule and says, Whoa, mule! He jumps off the mule and hands the reins to another man standing there and says, Hold my mule, man, while I dance Josie. And so now our corral would like to sing, Hold my mule while I dance Josie. Each culture has its own set of customs and traditions. One very interesting custom that was practiced by the slaves was that of being married by jumping over a broom. My grandmother, who was a slave in Virginia, was married by that same method. Here's the way you'd go about 
being married by jumping over the broom. On the wedding day, the bride and the groom would get together with some of their friends, and at the wedding ceremony, one friend would hold a broom parallel with the floor, about four or five inches above the floor. Then the bride and the groom would hold hands and jump over the broom, and that was it. They were married. They might have a little lemonade and cookies. The masters say, well, y'all married now. Have a good time. Y'all go on and dance. And they'd dance a little while and then go on their way. Not only were the black slaves married this way, but white people as well. It was even done in foreign countries, such as England, Ireland, Wales, and by the gypsies in Spain. I found a nursery rhyme in southern Indiana, which showed how common this method of jumping over the broom was. Any time a custom gets into a nursery rhyme, it's very, very common. So this nursery rhyme says, My dollies are going to be married. It's simple as simple can be. They merely jump over the broomstick, and then they are married, you see. Now that's a cute little poem, and you know it had to be a widely known custom if it were used in a nursery rhyme. Back during the slave days, if a man and woman wanted to get married, in a Catholic region like Louisiana, and they lived in a place that was visited by the priest only once or twice a year, the father of the bride would sign a certificate saying that on this day, my daughter so-and-so was married to Pierre so-and-so, and that sufficed until the priest got around to confirming the marriage when he came up. There's a wonderful little folk poem I found that concerns marriage of a slave couple. This couple was getting married and there was a black minister who wanted to confirm the marriage from a religious point of view. And so he says in the poem at the wedding, Dark and stormy may come the weather. I jines this he male and this she male together. Let none but him that makes the thunder put this he male and this she male asunder. I therefore announce you both the same. Go long, be good, keep up your name. The broom's been jumped. The world's not wide. She's now your own. Salute your bride. Here's another interesting tradition which grew up around Christmas time, and I want to talk about that for a little bit. Christmas time was a real time of celebration for most slaves. The workload was usually lightened during this period, and sometimes slaves were given time off to take part in their own celebrations. While it is true that some slave owners showed considerable amount of kindness during this season of the year, the opposite was also the case. Many slaves received no special favors and were subjected to the same horrible living and working conditions all year long. I remember a cute little story about one particular group of slaves who used their wit to help make the holiday season a little brighter for themselves. As the story goes, this group of slaves go up to the master around Christmas time, and they say, Master, it's almost Christmas, and we've not had any meat to eat all year long. It sure would be nice if you could see fit to share a little of your meat that you have at this time of the year. The slave owner said, Y'all go on back to the slave quarters. I'm going to eat what I want, and then I'm going to give the rest away to my friends. But y'all ain't going to get any of it, so go on back to work. Well, a few days later, it's Christmas Eve morning, early, about four o'clock, and the master is awakened by the sound of crying and mourning. He goes outside, down by the pig pen, all the slaves crying and making an awful noise. The master goes down, and he says, what in the world is the matter? And the slave says, oh, it's terrible. Every one of those hogs got sick and died with malitis, master. Another says, yeah, that's right. One of them got it, and then they all got it. And pretty soon, every one of them died with that awful sickness. And they said, what you want us to do with them, master? What you want us to do? You want us to get them ready so you can store them in the smokehouse and eat them when you want us to? Master said, if these hogs die with malitis, I'm not going to eat them. Go bury them or eat them yourselves if you want to, but don't let them get near me. Well, the next day is Christmas, and down in the slave quarters, all the slaves are sitting down to a feast. First meat they've had in a year. A little boy about six years old says, Grandma, 
How did we get all this meat? And Grandma said, well, it's like this, son. Christmas Eve morning, about 2 o'clock, Uncle George went into that hog pen over there, and he hit one of them hogs between the eyes with a mallet, and that hog fell over with manitis. Then he went to another hog. He hit that hog between the eyes, and that hog fell over with manitis. And it seems that every hog that Uncle George hit between the eyes with that mallet fell over and died with that dreadful disease, manitis. (laughs) We have a Christmas song in this collection which grew out of the tradition back during the slavery days. The name of the song is Christmas Gift, and here is the tradition behind the song. Early on Christmas morning, around 5 o'clock, Mr. A goes to B's house and knocks at the front door. And while B's come to open the door, A stands aside so B can't see him. And as B opens the door, A jumps out and says, Christmas gift! Now B knows that somebody would be coming. And so he tries to be first. He says, Christmas gift! Christmas gift! Sometimes A would knock on B's front door and then go around to the back door and sneak through the kitchen. A will come on into the living room, and when B opens the door, A is standing right behind it, and he yells, Christmas gift. B turns around and yells, Christmas gift. I said it first. And there they argue for a half hour about who said Christmas gift first. Then when they get through arguing, well, the one who admits he was last may give the other one an apple or an orange or something like that as a small present, you know. So we would like to sing Christmas gift. I said it first, so now hand it here. Let's go. 
Another section of our folk songs includes street cries and work songs. And these are the two things I want to talk about now. Street cries were short songs made up and sung by vendors going down the street selling something. And even today in parts of our country, there are still street cries being sung and used to draw attention to articles for sale. I remember hearing a street cry out in California many, many years ago, sung by a man selling vegetables. This man came down the street in a big wagon and sang a song that sounded like this. Sweet potatoes, yellow yams, Lord have mercy, yeah I am, string beans. And then went on in to, to tell what else he had for sale. Another spontaneous song form was the work song. The slaves working on the plantation saw no reason in the world to sing and work fast when they had to do it every day of their lives. If there was a, an incentive for working hard, that's one thing. But when you have to go to spend the rest of your life working for your master for nothing at all, I don't think many of them saw any need of trying to work faster and trying to get the job done. It was never done until they died. After the war, the slaves came off the plantation and got jobs in the same cotton fields, but now they had to be paid. Some worked in stone quarries, some railroads, and some were stevedores who loaded freight on board ships. So these workers would sing songs about their particular jobs, and it would sometimes help them pass the time away or, in other cases, provide an incentive to work faster and get more pay. If you were picking peanuts, and you got paid by the amount you picked, then you could sing a lively song which would help to keep your spirits up and to keep you working in a steady rhythm. We have a fine example here of the type of work songs that were sung during the Reconstruction days. This old hammer. It's almost 12 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, and the men working on the railroad are about to finish their work for the day. Their wives have come down to the work site because it's payday, and after everyone gets his pay, there's going to be a celebration. These men are singing this song to give them encouragement in the last few minutes of their work. Many of you will remember the legend of John Henry, who pitted his strength against that of the steam drill. And naturally, the steam drill, being mechanical, went on to beat John Henry. Well, these men in this song are saying, I'm not going to be like John Henry. This old hammer killed John Henry, but this old hammer won't kill me. I'm going to work a while, and I'm going to rest a while. In this song, you can hear the noises the men make with their voices when they come down with the heavy sledgehammers. Come on now, let's get that hammer. Let's go back. Work ain't hard, and the boss ain't mean. Food ain't good, cause the cook ain't clean. Our chorale now sings, this old hammer killed John Henry. This old hammer killed John Henry. This old hammer killed John Henry. This old hammer killed John Henry.
some remarks about storytelling. As was their tradition in Africa, slaves often told stories by setting them to music. There's a song about Belshazzar's feast that shows how slaves made the words fit the rhythm they wanted to use, and it also showed some classic but authentic dialect used during this time. You remember the story in the Bible about the feast of Belshazzar, when right in the middle of the feast, a hand began writing on the wall, and everybody got scared. Belshazzar looked around and said to his magicians, Y'all know what that meant? Can none of y'all tell me what it says? And they said, No, King, we don't know. We never saw writing like that. But we got a little boy, a little Jewish boy down here in jail. He's real smart. Maybe he can translate it for you. So they went down and got Daniel out of jail. And the minute Daniel came in and looked on the wall, he said, Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. The king said, what's that? He said, oh, king, that's too bad. What you mean is too bad? He said, it means that you have been put on the scales of justice and you have been found wanting. King, you ain't long for this world. Now, I imagine that the slave who made up the song I'm going to sing for you may have been a, a driver for his master. One Sunday in the middle of the summer, he takes his master to church, stands outside the window as the minister does a sermon on the story of Belshazzar's feast. The idea of a hand writing on the wall fascinated him. A ghost, just a hand writing. Couldn't see a thing, but just a hand. So when he takes his master home and puts up the horses, he goes down to the slave quarters and gathers his contemporaries around him and says, listen here. I heard a wonderful sermon up the white church this morning. And they said, what is it all about? And now he's going to make a song out of it. He wants this song to be in the meter of two. He wants to start it off like the beginning of the minister's text. If it starts it off in pure English, it will sound like this. Bill Shazza had a feast and there was a hand writing up on the wall. This was the melody he came up with. And you see how funny it would sound if he tried to get all these words into his duple meter? Now here's what he does to solve that problem. And in his solution, you'll see his concern with rhythm overshadows his desire to get all the words in. He puts it like this. Belshazzar had a feast and there's a hand writing on the wall. Belshazzar had a feast and there's a hand writing on the wall. A feast and there's a. I like that word. And it fits his rhythm pattern. Here's the way you spell it. F-E-A-S apostrophe N apostrophe D-A-Z-A. Feast and there's a. Come and read it. Come and read it and tell me what it said there. Hand writing on the wall. Now the second verse is what the hand wrote on the wall. The hand said, Meanie, meanie, teko, ufasi. Now again, he couldn't fit all that mess into the melody and keep the rhythm just the way he wanted it. So he just left out the part that didn't fit. That's all. And here's the way it sounded. Meany, meany, teko, said the hand, writing on the wall. Meany, meany, teko, said the hand, writing on the wall. So you see, he solves another problem so that the rhythm is never sacrificed. Now he gets to the third verse, which he had created, and he wants to use the words terrestrial and celestial. Now those are real knockout student words for you. If he had tried to sing terrestrial and celestial, there's a hand, he would have messed his rhythm up and probably given everybody a bath besides. 
So he makes it nice and easy, and he says, Tear us all and sell us all a hand, writing on the wall. Tear us all and sell us all a hand, and so forth. Now, that's rich, authentic dialect for you. And if you didn't know what tear us all and sell us all meant, that was just your hard luck. He knew what he was talking about, and so did his friends. We as slaves weren't trying to copyright these songs and sell them. We were merely trying to tell the fascinating Bible stories and make each other happy. So this man, through his concern for rhythm and his use of dialect, has made something of beauty out of something which might seem ridiculous somewhere else. Late in the evenings, especially in the summertime, it was popular to sit outside and tell stories. As you would expect, all the little children would be sitting around listening to the stories and enjoying the wonderful folk history. Well, invariably, these sessions would end with the most gruesome ghost stories you ever heard. Our final song tells one of these stories in music. There are still many people who believe in ghosts. A house in Massachusetts that's infested with spirits or ghosts is called a haunted house. Down in Tennessee, they call it a hainted house. But my grandmother in Virginia called it a haunted house. No matter how you pronounce it, it's the same old ghost. So here is a storytelling song called That Old House is Haunted. Down in the town where I was born, there was a haunted house. And all the folks that passed that way would scoot by like a mouse. Now, Captain John that owned the house had died some years before. But neighbors claimed they'd seen him there standing in the door. That old house is haunted. That old house is haunted. I said, that old house is haunted. And I ain't going there no more. And every night the strangest sounds would come from out that way. Them hands would carry on all night long till roosters crowed for days. Old Deacon Brown was bold and brave, at least that's what folks all said. He often claimed he'd like to talk and mingle with the dead. So a prize was offered to the man, he might be black or white, who'd stay there in the captain's house so folks could sleep at night. Well, Deacon Brown was bold, he said, so he promised us that he would stay out there a week and stop them hands or buzz. That old house is hanging, that old house is hanging, I said that old house is hanging, and I ain't going there no more. <laughs> well, first night all was going swell, till long about one or two. Then pretty soon a little cat come trotting into view. Well, what a pretty little cat, said the deacon sort of slow. But as he looked down at the cat, that thing began to grow. Till after a while, she was three feet tall, he could wipe his cheek and then looked around to find the door, and the cat began to speak. I wonder where it could not be. He's late again tonight. If he don't come in pretty soon, there sure gonna be a fight. That old house is hanging. That old house is hanging. I said, that old house is hanging. And I ain't going there no more. <laughs> well, that scared Deacon most to death, but he was bold, all right. Because he sat there and held his ground from then till broad daylight. But next night, honey, things were worse because four cats come this time. The largest one was solid black, the others white as lime. Old Deacon Brown sat there just so sweat all running down. Too weak to move because on each side these cats was laying round. Ain't none of y'all seen old Martin yet, announced the cat in black. He told us all to stay right here and wait till he got back. That old house is hanging, that old house is hanging. I said that old house is hanging, and I ain't going there no more. <laughs> well, Deacon buttoned up his coat and then reached for his hat. And as he passed out through the door, he spoke back to the cat. 
Now, I don't know who Martin is, nor how soon he'll be on. But you catch him, Martin, when he comes, that I've been here, but I'm gone. Yes, he's gone, 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 gone. He's gone, 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 gone. Cause that old house is hanging. That old house is hanging. I said that old house is hanging. And I ain't going there no more. Cause that old house is hanging. That old house is hanging. I said that old house is hanging. And I ain't going there.